We're going to talk about overall primary disabilities, um, typical disabilities, and secondary disabilities, and factors that you can do to reduce the secondary disability. This is just about everything a child needs to do successfully to be successful in life. Children with fetal alcohol spectrum disorders have problems taking information in. They can repeat what they're told, but they cannot recall it when they need to use it at the appropriate time. They can learn rules like chores, but on Thursday night you need to go pick up your dirty laundry and put it in the hamper and da 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 da. But then when Thursday comes, they're not able to pull that information out and use it. Um, even if they do recall information, they have difficulty recognizing how to use that information in any given situation. Um, and these are not unique to FASD. They can occur with a lot of disabilities, um, and there are ways that you can deal with this. And, and you got, the, all that work here are probably already using a lot of those techniques. Um, I'm going to talk in a few minutes at some of the neat little tools I can give you that you may not know about to help with dealing with some of these problems. Also, they have lower IQs, not always though. Um, it, fetal, a full-blown fetal, fetal alcohol syndrome will have a lower IQ, but the average IQ for somebody with FAS is 79 and the average IQ for somebody with partial FAS is 90. And of course, a normal would be a hundred, around 100. So partial FAS can still be very, very functional and go on and have independent living and um, do well. And their adaptive functioning independently and be able to cope with life they can learn how to communicate, do self-care, have their own living environment. They also have a lot of problems with sensory integration and how their body responds to stimuli, sights, lighting, hearing, smell, touch. And this has to do with probably some of the other disabilities you're working with, but for example, a uh, partial FAS child, it's their first day in kindergarten or in Head Start, they walk in, they see the hanging things from the lights, the bright bulletin boards, all the kids, and all that stimulation, and it's just going to overwhelm them. They're not going to be able to focus on one thing and function well in that environment. Um, things like um, Certain textures of food they may refuse, literally refuse to eat because of the way they feel. Um, they often get labeled clumsy. They bump into other people and objects. Um, they also can hurt themselves because they don't feel pain because of the sens sensory damage. They not. I'm saying. I'm not saying they don't feel any pain but they don't feel pain as vividly and as intensely as other children, so they're more likely to, to get hurt. They are also, as they get older and dressing themselves, might, might dress inappropriately for the weather, not being able to connect up, oh, it's raining out, I need to put a raincoat on and instead be in shorts with no coat. Uh, those are the kind of the connections they don't make. They have me a lot of memory problems. They have difficulty in math because when you're working with math problems, you have to have foundation for math, which requires like formulas and being able to recall something from somewhere else that you're pulling forward. Multiplication tables, you have to be able to recall all of that. And, and these kids have a lot of issues around memory, time sequencing, they forget the first event by the time they get to the last. They can't remember what the first was. Do these sound like some of the issues that you're already dealing with in other disorders, right? So you can see how these kids, unless they, and this is one of the problems, the partial fetal alcohol effect often does not get diagnosed because people are looking for all the facial features 
And so when they don't see that, they automatically assume, oh, it's not fetal alcohol, okay? So, so this gets missed a lot with these, with these kids. Oppositional, they're very occasionally oppositional. Um, they may, you may tell them to put their, their clothes away and make their bed and give them, and brush their teeth and get their jammies on and they don't follow through and then you go in there and say, well, why didn't you follow through? Well, because they can't really remember the sequence of many things in a, in a line like that. But they're not going to tell you that because they don't want to appear to be stupid. So they just say, oh, I don't know. I just didn't do it. But it may be that they can't remember what it was that you told them to do. And they often struggle with deciding in any given situation what to apply. For example, um, you may tell a child this FASD not to talk to strangers, but um, so then they're in school and they get a substitute teacher and they won't talk to them because they can't make those fine distinctions between that. Or you might tell a kid, don't run in the street, you will get hit by a car, but then you're going to see them walk in the street. Well, you said not to run, right? So they're, they're going to have problems like that. And they don't ask a lot of questions. They're often very verbal. Um, and that was something that my daughter had that you wouldn't know by the way she talked that she had a lot of these problems because she could talk the talk. She just couldn't walk the walk. <laughs> You know, so they often bluff people by being very verbal. They want to fit in. They don't want people to know that there's something wrong with them. And they don't know what questions to ask and when to ask them. So they have, they have problems processing information. Uh, they say they understand when they don't. Well, all kids have this. Yeah, mom, I know. But these kids really have it. They'll say, yeah, I understand, I understand, and they don't understand. And here's a really good one. Straighten up your room and put your toys away. Do you understand? And here's the kid thinking, okay, how do I straighten up? Make sure my bed is straight? See, they're having that, that executive functioning issues. Um, and they often misinterpret other people's body language and words and stuff. And this is a real problem when they get to be adolescents because they have this real need to be liked and be accepted. They're not quite sure how to read people. And so they're real susceptible to being in, in gangs and getting hooked in with the wrong group of people. They have problems with strangers. They are rule breakers. They don't learn from natural consequences. That's a really good one because that, here, that's the part of the brain we're talking again about the corpus callosum where you connect up behaviors and actions. And what's really important for working, one of the things that doctor, I'm, we had a doctor that spoke to us the first part of this month who's really working with these kids, and he said the best treatment for these kids is really get down to the basic behavioral conditioning, positive reinforcement. They do something right. Reward them. Reward them right in the moment, right at that time when they're doing, and help them develop patterns over and over and over. And the more they do that, the, the better they're going to do. But you can't have a kid break a rule and three days later get called into the principal's office at school and expect them to connect up what they did with what's happening to them at that moment. These kids aren't going to be able to do that. And they, of course, have self-esteem issues and they have multiple losses. Let me remember when I told you about my daughter and holding that picture up and her looking. Once she realized what was going on with her, she really experienced a sense of loss of she realized her potential may not be that she's going to go on and become a neurosurgeon or something like that. So she had a loss in her life as a result of being disabled that way. They also often have 
other numerous losses because a lot of them are coming out of family systems where there's alcohol and drugs being used and they're being pulled out of them and put into foster homes so they have loss of family. Um, and so we have all that. They have issues with money. Um, they spend whatever money they have without being able to consider what they need for the next day or the next week. And I see this with my daughter in money management. I'm so glad she has a boyfriend now who hopefully is not giving her credit cards and that kind of stuff. Because <laughs> uh, they really don't think long term about that. They're often gullible, naive to peer pressure. They believe what other people tell them. They have a hard time identifying when people are lying to them. OK, secondary disabilities. We see all of these, and this is where you guys are probably running into these kids more than anywhere else. You're seeing them when they're coming in because somebody thinks there's a mental health issue or they're disruptive in school. Um, the, there's a study here, the University of Washington uh, looked at secondary disabilities related to fetal alcohol disorders. It was a four-year study. They looked at 415 individuals with FAS or partial FAS um, who had been through their clinic, and they ranged in age from 6 to 51 years old. Um, and in addition to having the fetal alcohol diagnosis, a significant portion experienced second disabil secondary disabilities. Here's what they played out like 94% of those 415 had a mental, an additional mental health diagnosis, 43% had experienced school difficulties, 60% of those aged 12 and older had been involved with the criminal justice system, 50% had experienced confinement in jail or treatment centers, 45% had engaged in inappropriate sexual behavior. Here we go with them not being able to judge appropriate, taking knowledge they have and applying it, appropriate sexual behavior. They often have a lot of sexual acting out in adolescent years, having sex randomly with people they hardly know. You will see that. 24% of the adolescents, 46% of these adults, and 35% overall had their own alcohol and drug problems. And that's a no-brainer, right? Because we know there is some genetic predisposition. We don't know exactly yet, but you, are, you think now about here's this baby being prenatally exposed to alcohol and most likely drugs because most alcoholics don't just drink alcohol. They do drugs too. Then here this child grows up and drinks alcohol, they are hypersensitive to probably developing addiction faster than somebody that wasn't prenatally exposed to. And we, I think there are a lot of studies that show that. I think there's some twin studies out there that show if you are prenatally exposed that you're more likely to develop addiction. 79% uh, of these individuals in this study had problems keeping jobs, and 83% experienced problems where they had to live with somebody at some time because they couldn't support themselves independently. There's things that you can do to help people with FASD function better. Um, a stable home environment, early diagnosis. I was talking to Lauren about this before this started. Why, I, I had a doctor I was working with, and I was trying to get him enthused about going and getting trained to be able to diagnose this. And his statement to me was, well, what, what good is it to put a label on them if the treatment is going to be pretty much the same? Okay, That was his question to me. And what I know is if you tell somebody this is why you're struggling with these issues, they're more likely to do better if they understand they're not being willfully bad or behaviorally conduct bad, right? If you knew a child had a birth defect versus a behavioral problem, would that change the way that you were going to interact with that kid? 
Probably, right? So it'd be like having a Down syndrome kid versus a kid with a behavioral problem. Would you treat them differently? Probably, right? So that's why we need to really um, advocate for this to be diagnosed. And, and also the individual themselves, when they get older, has ability to understand why are these things happening to me. Because even though they may have borderline intellectual, they're still human beings. And they still know and think and understand, right? And they can understand, oh, I, I have fetal alcohol. Oh, that's why this stuff is happening to me. I'm not a bad person, right? Do you think that might affect how, how this child does in their life? Yeah. And I think a lot of people are like, well, why do you want to even find this out? We're, we're already treating their attention deficit, and they've already got a diagnosis of autism, so what good is it going to do to put this other label on them? And, of course, stable home environment, um, not vi no violence, early diagnosis, um, which, of course, is not all the things that our kids that we work with don't have, right? There, a lot of them are in foster care. A lot of them have home environments that are seeped with alcohol and drug abuse going on. Uh, they, they don't have, so anything that you can do with them to help them obtain some of these factors in their life that are going to help them do better.